Hi, I'm Dr. Dr. Matthews. I'm going to be giving you a quick overview on some electrocardiogram fundamentals. Um, so this could be a much longer lecture. It could even be an entire course. So this is simply going to be sort of a crash course for electrocardiogram. And there's a couple of textbooks I want to point out here. The first one is Dale Dubin's Rapid Interpretation of EKGs, the sixth edition. And then the second one is the American College of Sports Medicine's Guidelines for Exercise Testing Prescription, the 10th edition. And for this, it's primarily Appendix C that uh, I think you should be looking at. But with either of these, if you scan the QR code next to the book, um, book title, you'll be able to see what book I'm talking about and see where you can purchase the book. Looking at the sequences for exercise prescription tasks, we are on step number six, which is the resting test that you do before doing anything exercise related. And we're specifically talking about ECG or electrocardiogram. So an electrocardiogram is something that is going to be pretty common in a clinical setting. But if you're in a um, fitness center or gym type setting, you probably won't be doing ECGs or interpreting them yourself. But you might be getting clients who've had ECGs done because of uh, various issues in their, in their past. And you want to know a little bit about ECG so you can understand what was found and how to then treat that client. The electrocardiogram can be abbreviated as ECG or EKG. They're the same thing, just different texts and different individuals uh, use one of these or the other. Um, I typically use ECG, but I may occasionally slip up and say EKG, but again, remember those are the same thing. All right, so let's talk about what electrocardiograms or electrocardiography is. All right, so to start at a sort of global level here, the heart's job is to contract and to push blood out of the heart into the body. Um, and with that, it brings nutrients and oxygen and things like that. Um, the cardiac muscle or the myocardium is what does that contraction, and it's going to contract when it gets an electrical current or some sort of electrical stimulus. Um, and therefore, if you study the heart's electrical activity, uh, it's going to give you some information about how the heart is contracting, and that is the idea here. So electrocardiology is the study of the electrical activity of the heart in order to learn something about how the heart is functioning. Cardiac muscle cells are typically polarized at rest, um, and then they become depolarized, which is going to initiate the contraction, and then they become repolarized, so they go back to rest and they can restart that cycle. Um, so I'm gonna go over a little bit of that here, but I'm going to skip over most of the details. So if you don't know much about um, the, the function of muscle and how it becomes polarized and how uh, it uses electrolytes to do so, I would refer you to this video um, shown by this QR code here that's going to tell you uh, how the neurons in the body become polarized and how they use action potentials um, just like muscle cells in order to carry a signal, but in the case of a muscle cell, it's in order to cause contraction. Um, so uh, you can scan that QR code in order to watch a video that's going to talk about that. Um, it's going to be a little bit different than what we're talking about here because it's going to be talking about a neuron. Um, cardiac muscle functions in mostly the same way, but there's a little bit more going on, but you'll still be able to, for the most part, keep up if you watch that video. If not, you should probably go and look up some sources online or textbook sources. Um, but let's move on from that. Um, so first, the electrolytes are primarily going, the positive electrolytes are going to be primarily on the outside of the cell. And this is the reason why the cell is polarized, because there's a more positive charge outside the cell than inside the cell. Um, and when this is the case, the cell is at rest, so it's not contracting. Um, and when, a, when the heart is at rest, we call that diastole. This is the period of time where that chamber of the heart is going to fill with blood. And typically the chamber we're talking about is the left ventricle of the heart. All right, so um, step two here is going to be when we have positive electrolytes flow inside the cell. And this is going to happen when there is some sort of an electrical stimulus or an electrical wave that comes to that cell and causes what we call depolarization. So that depolarization is the switching of the electrical charge. So again, positive electrolytes flow inside the cell, switching the, char the charge of that cell, and it becomes depolarized. And this is what's going to initiate the contraction of that muscle cell.
And so when the heart contracts, that is systole, and that is the period of time where blood is ejected from the heart. Then the next step is going to be to uh, allow positive electrolytes to flow outside of the cell again, um, and this is going to repolarize the cell so that there is a positive charge outside and a negative charge inside, just like it was when it started and it was resting, and this is what's going to end the contraction. And when you end the contraction, that's the end of systole, so that's when the blood stops ejecting out of the heart. So it's important to realize that cardiac muscle cells are all electrically connected to one another. So if one of the muscle cells depolarizes, it's going to spread out from that and cause the cells around it to depolarize. Kind of like what we're seeing here um, in this diagram of the left ventricle, where right here we have a cell depolarizing and the spread of depolarization is flowing away from that in these ripple-like waves. And when each of these cells get that wave electrical impulse, it's going to then cause it to contract. And it's required that the heart functions in a very coordinated way in order for this to work and for the heart to pump blood as it needs to. Let's combine the idea is of depolarization and repolarization and electrolytes flowing in and out with what you'll see on an ECG. Uh, so essentially here we have some simplified diagrams. Uh, imagine each of these sort of tube-like structures as a muscle cell in the heart. Um, so a single myocytes or a single um, muscle cell. And we have an electrode on one side and another electrode on the other side. Um, and just like with ECG, one of those electrodes is negative, one of those electrodes is positive, and we just assign it that. There's, there's nothing different about them. There's the same type of electrode. Um, we just, uh, using our computer within the electrocardiogram system, it's going to say this is positive, this is negative. It just chooses, and there's a way we, we do it in a standardized way, but it's something we'll get to later on. Um, so, Again, on each side of the cell, we have electrodes, negative and positive, and then the cell itself, uh, remember, at rest, which is what's being depicted here, has more positive electrodes on the outside, which means the inside of the cell has a negative charge compared to the outside of the cell, which has a positive charge. Um, and so if we look at a situation like this, and we look at the ECG, there's going to be no wave. It's just going to be a flat line. Um, we call that an isoelectric line, meaning there's no wave, there's no deflection up or down. Um, and then if we cause depolarization, remember depolarization are when the positive electrodes that are outside flow inside the cell, and that's going to flow like a wave down uh, each of the uh, muscle cells and also to the adjacent muscle cells. Um, so it's just going to be a big wave that flows through the heart. And so if we look again, here's our negative electrode, here's our positive electrode, and we have a positive wave flowing towards the positive electrode. And what I mean by positive wave is the inside of the cell is becoming positive. All right, so it's becoming positive and that wave is flowing towards the positive electrode. That's going to give us an upward wave, so a positive wave. All right, and we can also have negative waves. So let's reverse this direction of flow. Um, so let's have the same positive wave, but now instead of flowing towards the positive electrode, it's flowing away from the positive electrode and towards the negative electrode. And this is going to be perceived by the positive electrode as something leaving it. So essentially it's losing charge, it's losing charge towards the negative electrode. And so that's going to be seen on the ECG as a negative wave, so a downward facing deflection. When the inside of the cell is depolarized, like shown here, um, there's no electrical current. There's no waves moving one way or another. Um, and if there's no waves moving, regardless if it's polarized or depolarized, the ECG is going to look the same. It's going to be just isoelectric flat line. There's no deflection. There's no waves in the ECG. The difference is, in this situation, when the cell is polarized, it's going to be relaxed. In this situation where the cell is depolarized, it's going to be contracted. Um, and because that's what's required for a muscle cell to contract is for it to become depolarized. But now in order for the cell to relax, in order to start over again, remember the heart pumps so it contracts and lets go, contracts and lets go, contracts and lets go. It has to have this cycle to it, right? So we have to repolarize the cell. Um, and so this is going to happen by the positive electrodes that were inside the cell moving back to the outside 
of the cell. Um, and in doing so, the inside of the cell becomes negative again, the outside of the cell becomes positive again, and this is going to, again, flow like a wave. Um, so if we have a, a flow, so if we have a wave moving away from the negative electrode and to the positive electrode, and now remember it's a negative wave because the inside of the cell is becoming negative, that's going to look like a negative wave on the ECG, so a downward deflection. Where it becomes slightly more complicated, and just slightly, is when the repolarization wave goes away from the positive electrode into the negative electrode. So remember, now we have a wave moving away from the positive electrode, but that wave is a negative wave. So we have a negativity leaving the positive electrode. So think of it as a double negative. Double negatives make a positive, right? So uh, doing so is going to cause a positive wave here. Now we're going to complicate things just a little bit further. It's, it's not much further, but just a little bit. All right, so we're back to the example. This is the exact same example that we started with. So we have a positive wave moving towards a positive electrode, making a positive wave on the ECG signal. All right, so we've already talked about that. It's nothing new. I'm just using it as our sort of baseline of information here. So now what happens when we have Instead of one muscle cell, cardiac muscle cell, we have two cardiac muscle cells, both depolarizing, so both having a positive wave, and that positive wave are, is moving towards the positive electrode in both of those. Notice what happens to the wave on ECG. They add together, right? So they add together, and so the wave on the ECG becomes bigger. And this is because what the ECG electrodes and what the ECG machine is actually seeing is going to be the net electrical activity. And you'll see more what I mean by that in a second. Um, but in this situation, it's going to add together. So instead of having a small positive wave, we have a large positive wave. In this example up here, we have these same two muscle cells, the same two cardiac cells that we showed down here, both depolarizing in the direction of the positive wave. But now let's add one more cardiac muscle cell um, depolarizing. But this time, instead of the wave moving towards the positive electrode, it's moving away from the positive electrode. And remember I said the ECG machine is going to see the net electrical activity. Here, the two are going in the same direction towards the positive wave, making a large positive wave. So we have two waves moving in this direction, one wave moving in this direction. So you get a net of essentially one wave moving towards the positive electrode, and you end up with another small wave similar to the original small wave when there was just one. All right, so again, remember, it's a net electrical activity. So when the electrical activity uh, waves move in opposite directions, they're gonna cancel each other out. And that's what's being shown in this last one. So now we have one muscle cell depolarizing, causing a positive wave moving towards the positive electrode. Another muscle cell depolarizing, causing a positive wave away from the positive electrode. Because of moving in opposite directions, they cancel each other out, and you end up with no wave. So it's as though neither of those happened. Uh, again, it's net electrical activity that we see. We do not see individual cells. Um, so we see sort of the summation in, of everything happening all at one time. So we've talked a little bit about um, what's happening at the cellular level, um, but we need to talk now about what controls this process. So what initiates the electrical signals? Remember, the muscle cells in the heart are typically only going to contract or depolarize when there's an electrical stimulus. So what creates that electrical stimulus? So within the heart, we have what we call pacemaker cells. All right, so we have pacemaker cells and we have those, uh, those cardiac muscle cells that we've been kind of talking about. The pacemaker cells are specifically designed not, not to contract, but to initiate an electrical stimulus as well as to carry it. It's essentially the wiring within the heart. So we have these series of wires that you see as these yellow lines. Down here we have the same yellow lines um, just pulled off the heart so you can see them by themselves. Um, but these are the, essentially the same diagrams, just one with the muscle on it and the muscle and the valves and everything on it and one without. All right, so where the signal starts in a normal healthy heart is going to be what's called the SA node or the sinoatrial node. And that's what I'm showing on each of these 
as this sort of pulsation signal that starts there and spreads out, right? Because that's how the electrical signal spreads. It starts in one spot and spreads away from that spot. And what it's going to do is it's going to spread into the muscle cells around it, causing them to depolarize and to, to contract. But it's also going to be carried by all these electrical pathways within the heart um, that, again, you're seeing in yellow. And those electrical pathways are going to work like a wire and allow the electrical signal to carry much, much faster than what it would if it simply moved from one muscle cell to the next muscle cell to the next muscle cell. Now, it can do that, and it does do that in some situations, um, specifically pathological situations, but normally the heart's electrical signal is going to spread through that wiring and as it does it's going to depolarize the muscle cells near that wiring and it's going to spread from that. It just makes the heart function in a coordinated fashion. Remember the coordination is very important here and it's going to cause the heart to depolarize quickly allowing it to contract quickly so that we can have rapid heartbeats and the things that we need in order to do stuff like exercise. And so again, the SA node is where this starts. It travels through internodal pathways within the atriums, these pathways shown right in here. And from that, it's going to reach back to the AV node. The AV node is important for a couple of reasons. It's important because it's the only electrical connection between the top of the heart, so the atriums, and the bottom of the heart. It's also important because it's going to get that signal, it's going to collect it back in, and it's going to then disperse it back to the, the ventricles, and it's going to do some things with timing that we'll talk about later. But remember, this is the only spot where the top of the heart and the bottom of the heart is electrically connected. Once the electrical signal gets itself to the AV node and then passes through the atrioventricular node, which is what the AV node stands for, it's gonna get into the bundle his or the AV bundle, um, same thing, just different names, and it's going to then split into two different bundles, the left and the left bundle branch, which goes to the left ventricle, and it's gonna to go to the right bundle branch, which is going to then supply the electrical signal to the right ventricle. And from these bundle branches, we have what we call uh, Purkinje fibers, uh, which are just these little offshoots that you see that are gonna go and excite the, uh, the majority of the muscle tissue in those different areas. And so again, this is the electrical wiring of the heart. This is how the signal gets around in a coordinated fashion, and it's how it uh, gets around quickly enough for us to have a functioning heart, for us to be able to get around and do the things we need. If anything here malfunctions, it's going to cause issues that will show up on the electrocardiogram, and it's also going to affect the function of the heart. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. Now, how do you perform an ECG? We're not going to cover this in detail here. Um, if you wanna know how to actually do the ECG and set up and apply all these electrodes, um, you should scan this QR code or go to this link here, and it'll go take you to a video where I talk about how to apply the electrodes, where those electrodes go, um, in order to get the person set up and ready for the machine to actually do the work. Um, I'm not gonna go over these here uh, right now, but here are the 10 different electrodes. Um, well, here's the actual names, the 10 different electrodes that are going to be placed on the body um, as well as the placement, so the anatomical locations that you're gonna look for in order to do that placement. So if you wanna see that here, pause this video now and look at this and read that table. Um, if not, you can again go to this this video and watch how to do it and I'll talk more about it in that video. We had all those electrodes, those 10 different electrodes that we uh, applied to the body. Um, most of it's gonna go in the chest, some of it's gonna go on the upper end or lower end of the torso, so off the chest, um, or on the arms and legs themselves. Um, and the reason we have these 10 different electrodes is we're going to combine them within the computer algorithms within the ECG machine in order to get what we call leads. Um, in a typical electrocardiogram, uh, tracing is going to show 12 different leads. Those 12 leads are listed right here. And basically what they are are different views of the heart. So if you look at this diagram over here, you notice that each of these leads, these blue leads, or these red leads, are going to come out from the heart at a different direction. So 
Think of it like having different camera angles of the same thing. It allows you to figure out a little bit more information than if you have only a single camera angle looking at an object, right? So especially if it's something that's moving. moving. So if you have a camera angle like the AVF lead that's looking at the downward part of the heart, or you have another camera angle like the lead one, um, that's going to look at the um, left side of the heart, so the lateral side of the heart. Um, and they're going to show you different information. There's a lot of overlap, but there's also some different information that can be useful. Um, and so I'm not going to go over all this here either. This is something that you can study and just sort of memorize. So pause the video right now and study this table if you haven't seen this before. Um, but essentially what this table is showing, again, is the common leads, the 12 different ones. Um, that are formed by the, the, the different electrodes. In this table, there's the negative electrode for each lead, which for some of them, there's only one. For others, there's two. For others, there's three different electrodes that come together to make the negative electrode. Um, and then for each one, there's a positive electrode, like what we talked about before when we were talking about the waves moving back and forth. These are the same positive and negative electrodes, but applied to the entire heart, um, giving us leads. And so each of these is going to have a different um, positive electrode. And then we have the ground electrode, which is going to be the same for all of them. It's always going to be the right leg. And you also here have the view of the left ventricle that we get from these different electrodes. And the reason why I see the left ventricle, the majority of the time when we're studying the heart, we're studying the left side of the heart. Um, it's the part that uh, pumps blood to the entire body. It's the part that if it starts to fail, you start to lose function. And obviously if it fails completely, you end up passing away and dying. Um, but so we put a lot of effort towards that. And for the most part, these are all focused on the left side of the heart. Moving forward at this point, uh, most of the conversation is going to be about the lead two. And if so the reason for that, if you look at lead two here, it essentially runs the length of the heart uh, down the middle of the heart because the heart has a little bit of an angle. And it's going to have the majority of the electrical activity running in uh, parallel to lead to, so you're going to get a lot of really large waves and it's going to be sort of an obvious ECG. So typically when you see an ECG tracing where there's just a single lead, it's lead two. So the lead two is sort of the stereotypical lead for ECG. And so going forward, that's what we're going to be talking about. So here's your lead two. So the negative electrode is your right arm lead. The positive electrode is your left leg lead going sort of diagonally across the chest, which is in line with sort of the yellow wiring that is being depicted on the heart, which are the electrical network of the heart. Um, and then here is a, a drawing of the lead to a stereotypical lead to. Um, so let's talk about all these different waves and intervals and segments here. Um, just so you know, a wave is when there is a positive or negative deflection uh, of the signal. A segment is a period of time, so a, a duration of time where there is no wave. And then an interval is a period of time when there's at least one wave inside that period. All right, so that's why we have intervals, waves, segments. That's what they all mean. And so each of these it means something. It tells you something about what's happening in the heart. And we can now go over those different parts and talk about why each of these shapes, including some of the flat lines, why they are important. All right, so it's important to understand what they mean in order to uh, in understand the interpretation. And we're really not going to get to so much in this video, but that you might want to um, in a future video or a future class in order to understand the utility of ECG. All right, so the first wave here is called the P wave, and these are going to be labeled starting with P just along the alphabet, so P, Q, R, S, T. Um, so again, the P wave is the first wave that we see that is atrial depolarization. So remember, depolarization is what starts contraction. So this is going to be um, a positive uh, deflection, so a positive wave, because it moves from the SA node in this direction in its depolarization. So it's a positive wave moving towards the positive electrode, and we end up with a positive upward wave on the ECG. And so this is the start of atrial contraction. Remember, traction goes from depolarization all the way to the end of repolarization. 
All right, so the next thing that we run into here is this flat segment that we call the PR segment because it goes from the P wave to the R wave. And in this situation, technically it's going to the Q wave, but we don't always see a Q wave, so we just call it the PR segment because sometimes a Q wave's there, sometimes it's not. All right, so the PR segment um, is going to mean two different things, uh, or two different things are happening here. One of those things is that the atrial action potential is in its plateau phase, so phase two of the action potential. So essentially, the action potential, you depolarize, it becomes the, the charge of the cell becomes positive, and then that positive charge just kind of plateaus and stays for a while, and then it comes back down, becoming negative and repolarizes. So this uh, plateau, I'm talking about that period of time where it stays positive and just kind of stays at that same level for uh, you know, a few milliseconds or so. And that is going to essentially cause the muscle uh, of the heart, so specifically right now I'm talking about the atriums, to contract and stay contracted for a period of time, allowing the blood to be forced out. And it gives you essentially a long enough contraction to, uh, to get the mechanical functioning of the, the blood leaving the atrium and going into the ventricles. The other thing that's happening during this PR segment is the AV node is depolarizing. Remember the AV node is this node here of um, pacemaker cells that essentially collects all of the electrical signal from the top of the heart and then it holds on to it for a brief period of time um, and then it depolarizes the bottom part of the heart. It's the only connection, the only electrical connection between the top and the bottom of the heart. And the reason why it's going to pause is because the same thing that's happening here. We need time from when the atrium start to contract to when the ventricles start to contract for the blood to go from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart, filling the ventricles. If they contracted at the same time or nearly the same time, basically the blood would just kind of sit there and jostle back and forth and not really uh, fill the ventricles so you can't get blood then out of the ventricles. So although the AV node is depolarizing, which normally you would expect to see some sort of wave happening when something is depolarizing, it's such a small amount of tissue that the electrocardiogram machine is not sensitive enough to pick up that little tiny electrical signal. And so we end up seeing it as a flat line, uh, meaning there's really no electrical activity happening here. Um, and so we have zero deflection of the ECG waveform. Um, and again, this is all very important, this PR segment, um, in order to allow blood to get from the atrium to the ventricles. All right, the next thing that we're going to find is the QRS complex, which is this uh, set of three waves here, so Q, R, and then S. The QRS complex is ventricular depolarization, so this is when the ventricles begin their contractions. Let me just pause for a moment and mention something that's important. So we had atrial depolarization, but you might be asking yourself, okay, so where is atrial repolarization? That actually occurs during this QRS complex, but because the QRS complex has a lot more muscle, which means a lot more muscle cells are going to be depolarizing. The repolarization of the much smaller muscle of the atrium is actually just going to be kind of hidden within this. So maybe you're asking yourself, why is there a QR and S? Why isn't there not just one wave? That's because the ventricles are very large and we have these long pathways that are essentially going to be feeding the electrical activity into the, into the ventricles. And so the first wave, the Q wave here, is giving you septal depolarization. So if you notice here, the left bundle branch comes down and has all these little Purkinje fibers kind of going up back towards the negative electrode. And because of that, the initial negative depolarization that we see here is the septum depolarizing away from this positive electrode and towards this negative electrode. Um, and that's why we get this small negative Q wave here. Um, the R wave is going to be when the electrical activity starts to flow down and out and sort of through both the right and left uh, ventricles, and that's the majority of the direction of the, the, the electrical wave. And so you get this huge R wave, this huge positive deflection because it's moving towards, it's a positive wave moving towards the positive electrode. All right, and then we have the S wave, which is a little negative wave here. Notice that the um, 
the wiring of the heart here kind of goes up and around the heart. And so whatever ventricular mass, ventricular uh, muscle mass is left to depolarize at this point, it's going to be depolarized by these upward uh, moving bundle branches uh, of the electrical wiring. So it's gonna cause some of the signal to go in the other direction back towards the negative electrode, causing a little negative wave here. Now the next feature on the ECG is going to be the ST segment, um, which is the isoelectric line, or should be an isoelectric line, um, starting where the S wave ends and ending where the T wave starts. And so this is going to be the period of the ventricle's uh, action potential plateau, so that phase two of the action potential again. So similar to the PR segment was phase two, so the plateau phase of the electrical signal for the atriums, the ST segment right here is also the plateau phase, so phase two of the um, ventricular action potential when there's no depolarization or repolarization wave happening is just sort of a consistent contraction without a change in electrical signal. Um, so that's what's going to cause it to have no wave, so no uh, positive or negative deflection on the ECG. Um, but during this time, the ventricles are contracted the whole time. Just like during this time up here, the atriums are contracted the whole time. All right, and then the last feature that we're going to see is going to be the T wave here. The T wave is ventricular repolarization. Remember that repolarization is when the positive ions inside the cell leave the cell, and so the outside becomes positive, the inside becomes negative again, and so it's a negative wave, okay? So we have, though, an upward wave, which tells us something here. So we have a negative wave, um, showing as a positive wave here, which means it's going away from the positive electrode towards a negative electrode. So we have a negative wave moving towards the negative electrode. Remember that double negative that I talked about? Double negative is going to make a positive, so we end up with the T wave being upright. And so if we put it all together, you can see in this diagram here, um, the electrical activity moving through the heart goes from the SA node through the atriums to the AV node, through the ventricles and then sort of up the sides and then here comes the repolarization wave going the opposite direction. Right? And that's what gives us this ECG tracing that we anticipate seeing on a lead to electrocardiogram. Up until now, all the ECG tracings that I've shown, or the really drawings of tracings that I've shown, have just been uh, a line on a white background. However, that's not how it's done in real life. In real life, we put we print our ECGs onto what we call ECG paper, uh, which has this grid pattern. Typically, it's a red grid, and it's uh, five by five, one millimeter blocks, and there's a bunch of these five by five blocks. All right, so on the x-axis we have time, so one millimeter, so one little block, is equal to 0 0.04 seconds. If we add five of these little blocks together, so we have one of these big blocks, that's going to be five millimeters or 0 0.2 seconds. On the y-axis here, we have millimeter blocks that represent the millivolt uh, voltage of the actual signal that we're getting from the heart. So one one millimeter block is one tenth of a millivolt. So if we have five millimeters, we have five tenths of a millivolt. And if we have 10 mil millimeters or two large blocks, um, we end up with one millivolt. And so this is sort of the standard way of calibrating an electrocardiogram machine. There are different paces and different voltages that some machines will use for special circumstances, but the vast majority of, of the time, if you see an ECG, it's going to have this sort of uh, calibration. Um, and this is obviously very blown up. The, these would be much smaller blocks, so they're supposed to be one millimeter by one millimeter. And so if we put an ECG onto um, one of these papers, it looks more like this. Um, so again, we have the ECG tracing going and we have these blocks that allow us to measure things like how long a wave happened for. So two blocks would be, mean it was 0.08 seconds long. 
If we had three blocks, that would mean it is 0.12 seconds long, and we can just keep adding the blocks up. And we can also count the millivolt uh, on the y-axis if we wanted to. Typically, we don't really talk about the uh, the units on the y-axis as millivolts, we usually just say millimeters, but we do talk about on the x-axis, we do uh, typically say seconds, not millimeters. Um, probably just to sort of differentiate from uh, y-axis. Um, but with that, we now can then figure out what the normal ranges are for lengths, so durations of waves and heights of waves and things like that. And so when we know what normal is, we can then look for the abnormal and try to figure out what's going on there. And that's essentially how ECG interpretation works. You know what's normal, so here are, are some basic um, parameters in the normal limits of those. I'll go over that in a second. So if you find something that's not in the normal, that typically means there's some sort of issue, some sort of uh, cardiac arrhythmia going on. As I just mentioned, this is a short list. Um, there are far more parameters than this out there. Um, if you want a longer list and also some example interpretations when something is outside of these normal limits, I would refer you to the ACSM guidelines um, for exercise testing and prescription, the 10th edition. Appendix C, Table C4, and if you scan this QR code there, it's going to show you the textbook I'm talking about. Let's go ahead and go through this table here. So we have R to R interval, which is the time between one R wave to the next R wave. The normal limits of that is going to be 0.6 to 1 second long. Um, so this would take somewhere between 0.6 and 1 second. The heart rates that go along with that are 60 to 100 beats per minute, and we would figure out the, the heart rates from the R to R interval by just dividing 60 by the R to R interval. That'll tell you the heart rate um, for any one cardiac cycle. There are other ways that are uh, gonna give you more of an average heart rate across several cardiac cycles, um, but we're not gonna go over that in this video. Um, those are the more typical ways of doing things, but I do want you just to know this sort of basic math here. Um, the P wave is typically less than 0.12 seconds in duration, so across the x-axis, and less than 2.5 millimeters tall on the y-axis. And it's usually upright in most of the leads. So it's not in all the leads, but most of the leads it's going to be upright. The PR interval, which goes from the beginning of the P wave to either the beginning of the Q or the R wave, um, essentially tells us um, the time it took for the, the electrical signal to go from the SA node through the AV node and get to the left ventricle. And so typically the PR interval is going to be between 0.12 and 0.2 seconds. Again, if it's outside of that range, either shorter or longer than that, it means there's something going on um, and you need to figure out what that something is. You need to interpret the, the waveforms a little bit. The Q wave, which is this next little downward deflect, deflecting wave, is typically less than 0.04 seconds, um, so essentially less than one millimeter block wide, and it's also typically less than 25% of the R wave amplitude. So if we look here, the R wave amplitude, we got about five millimeters, about 10 millimeters, about 15 millimeters, and maybe one more. So we got about a 16 millimeter R wave and about, let's see, one, two, about two and a half millimeter deep Q wave. So two and a half or 16 is less than 25%. Um, so it is within the normal ranges. And there are some exceptions to this where certain leads show things a little differently. The next parameter on our list is the QRS interval, which is the full uh, ventricular depolarization waveform, and that is typically somewhere between 0.06 and 0.1 seconds long. Um, the next one after that is the ST segment, so this isoelectric line between the S and the end of the S wave and the beginning of the T wave, and it's usually less than one millimeter um, up or down, so uh, elevated or depressed, from the isoelectric line. The isoelectric line is this line or this line, whichever one appears most normal, or an average of the two if they're a little deviated from one another. But essentially the isoelectric line is this right here, so the ST segment should be right on that, but we allow a plus or minus 
less than one millimeter. So if it gets to one millimeter, that's when you need to start again interpreting what's going on a little bit. And we have also some leads where things are a little bit different than what I just mentioned. We're given the parameters that are essentially what you're gonna see in lead two, um, as well as some of the other leads that are similar to lead two. And then we have the last param parameter on our list here, which is the T wave, this uh, ventricular repolarization wave. It's typically upright in leads one, two, V3, V4, V5, and V6. All right, so not the other leads, but these ones, it typically operates. Um, if it's not, that's actually a sign of myocardial ischemia, so lack of blood flow to the heart. So this table here is showing uh, a list of uh, different ECG abnormalities that the ACSM guidelines textbook lists at different points in time. And in this column right here, you can see some of the different tables and boxes where these are going to be listed. And the reason why I'm pulling these out specifically is in order to understand the guidelines textbook, which is a super important textbook for our field, you need to understand a little bit about these different abnormalities within uh, certain e people's ECGs. And so let's just go down this list and then I'll show some examples of these. I don't expect you to be perfect at interpreting ECGs based on this video. In, in fact, I'd be very impressed if you were good at it at all with this video. This is just a kind of, again, a crash course overview. Um, you're gonna need a little more information in order to be good at interpreting ECG, but I, I just want you to be familiar with what these are and uh, not necessarily how to find them as, as much as that they exist and what they mean. The first one on our list is multiple ectopic beats. So when something's ectopic, it means it's outside of where it's supposed to be. Remember that the SA node normally controls the rhythm, so it normally paces the heart. Um, so the electrical signal starts in the SA node and spreads throughout the heart from there. So if the electrical signal starts anywhere but the SA node, that is going to be some sort of uh, ir irregular beats or an ectopic beat. Simply having an ectopic beat here or there is not such a big deal. Lots of people have them, don't even know it. Um, but when you have lots of ectopic beats or you have ectopic beats from different locations happening um, in a short period of time, say six different ectopic beats per minute, that's when people tend to get more concerned. And just a little caveat here, um, I'm not a, a clinician, so this is not diagnostic advice. This is simply meant for educational purposes. But again, let's say you have six ectopic beats in a minute, that's probably a sign that you, um, you need to explore what's going on with your heart. Um, but the different types of ectopic beats can be premature atrial contractions um, or PACs. That's when the ectopic beat comes from somewhere within the atriums that's not the SA node. Uh, the next one is a premature junctional contraction or PJC. This is when the ectopic beat comes from the AV node. Um, and then we have premature ventricular contractions or PVCs. This is when the ectopic beat comes from somewhere within the ventricles. Right, the next thing on our list, or the next uh, pathology on our list, is tachycardia. Tachycardia is just an excessively fast heartbeat. Um, so it's when your heart goes much faster than it should. Um, typically it's defined as 150 to 250 beats per minute um, when there's not a reason for it to be doing so. So you, you're just resting and all of a sudden your heart just starts racing like that. Um, so we're not talking about exercise, we're not talking about something that's drug induced. We're talking about just normal resting heart rate of between 150 and 250 beats per minute. And this range does vary depending on the source, the textbook, or the normative values that you look at. So this, you're gonna see some different values out there. The next uh, pathology is a second degree AV block. So remember the AV node is the only place where the electrical signal goes from the atriums, the top of the heart, to the ventricles, the bottom of the heart. So if it becomes blocked or partially blocked, which is what a second degree block is, um, that means the electrical activity is not going uh, appropriately from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart. Um, and with a second degree block, that essentially means you have some P waves that don't have QRS complexes associated with that. And I'll show you again all of these, what it looks like on the future slides coming up in a few minutes. Um, but again, some P waves don't have QRSs. Some do, some don't. A third degree AV block is a more severe 
blockage of the AV node. And in this situation, the P waves in the QRS complexes, which uh, remember stand for atrial depolarization and ventricular depolarization, they're not associated with each other. They're doing their own thing. They're, they each have their own rhythm that are not coordinated with each other at all. Um, and that's a much bigger issue than a second degree block. The next one on our list is ST segment elevation. So this, remember the ST segment is between the QRS complex and the T wave. It should be isoelectric with the other isoelectric lines. So the um, PR segment and the TP segment, which is the segment between the end of the T wave and the beginning of the P wave for the next cardiac cycle. Um, so it should be in line if it's elevated. Um, that you're, We're going to talk about that in a minute, but it's a sign that you might be having a heart attack or someone might be having a heart attack. We also have on this list ST segment depression. So notice the ST segment is very important. Um, so if the ST segment is um, not isoelectric, but is actually lower than um, the isoelectric line. So up here it was a, a greater than one millimeter increase above the isoelectric line. Here we're talking about greater than two millimeters decrease below the isoelectric line. This is something that means, most likely means um, myocardial ischemia, so lack of oxygen or lack of blood flow to the heart. The last item on this list is when you have bundle branch blocks that are indistinguishable from ventricular tachycardia. So just like you could have a block of the AV nodes, you can have a blo block of the bundle branches, so the left and right bundle branches that feed the electrical signal to the left and right ventricles. And sometimes it's going to be a big deal, sometimes it's not. So when it starts to look like you're having ventricular tachycardia, so that would be up in this category here. If it looks like ventricular tachycardia, even though it's a bundle branch block, um, it's something that may be something you'd want to consider stopping uh, a test for, especially if you're doing some sort of stress test, um, simply because it's going to be really hard to accurately um, analyze the ECGs, and you might get yourself in a situation where they actually go into ventricular tachycardia, which can be very dangerous, and you wouldn't know it because the bundle branch block is actually hiding it from you. Um, and so um, this is going to be, the bundle branch block is when you have a QRS complex that is greater than 0.12 seconds long and you have two R waves. The reason for this will become clear when we get to that slide, but essentially, so you have an R and an R prime wave, two different R waves that are not in sync with each other. Um, because one of the branches is blocked, but we'll show the, that in a second. So we're going to go item by item on that table and show you some examples of that. So the ectopic beats, we again have PACs, uh, PJCs, and PVCs. All right, so depending on where the ectopic beat starts from, we have the PACs being shown here. You can see the arrows pointing at them. They essentially look like normal uh, cardiac cycles. They look just like the cardiac cycles before and afterwards, but they come early and they usually have this compensatory pause afterwards. Um, PJCs um, look fairly similar to PACs, but now there's usually not a P wave here. So again, it comes early, there's compensatory pause afterwards, but there's usually, again, a, a missing P wave because the signal is now starting in, in the AV node and working back towards the atriums as well as down to the ventricles. So the ventricular side of the ECG looks normal, but the atrial side is either missing altogether like it is here, which means it's buried within the QRS complex, or sometimes it's right before the QRS complex and upside down, or right after the QRS complex and upside down. Um, but that would be a PJC. A PVC, shown with these arrows, usually is a really wide um, QRS complex that looks very bizarre, like what the ones that you're seeing here. PVCs are typically pretty easy to point out if you're even remotely sim uh, familiar with looking at a normal ECG, like these here are all normal waves, these again are the PVCs. The next item on that table was tachycardia, and we can have tachycardia of uh, the sinus, so in other words, uh, of the SA node. When we say sinus rhythm, we're saying a rhythm from the SA node. 
um, we can have tachycardia from the junctional rhythm, so from the AV node, or we can have tachycardia of the ventricles. Uh, we have sinus tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia being shown here. Um, you can look up online for examples of junctional tachycardia. Um, I didn't want to show any here just because I didn't have the space. Um, but the sinus tachycardia and the ventricular tachycardia are both going to be unusually fast heart rhythms. So this one is about 150 beats per minute. This one's about 176 beats per minute. So it's unusually fast rhythms that are going to potentially start affecting the ability of blood to get out of the heart and into the body, simply because it's too fast for the heart to fill before it contracts. Um, so that's really the big uh, uh, fear with tachycardia. Second degree AV block was the next on the list. Uh, remember, this is when some but not all of the P waves have an associated QRS complex. So you can see three different types of second degree block here. So remember that we have P waves showing the atrial depolarization, then it gets to the AV node, which is where the blockage is, and then it get, the signal gets to the ventricles causing ventricular depolarization. So if there's a block here that's causing some of the signal not to get through, that's again AV, um, second degree AV block. And so you can see these different examples here. Um, this one, here's your atrial contraction, here's your ventricular contraction. So P wave, R wave, P wave, R wave, P wave. Notice the missing R wave here. So the missing QRS complex, T wave is missing as well because there wasn't a depolarization. Um, and then we go back to P wave, R wave. And this one here, P wave, R wave, P wave, R wave, P wave, R wave, P wave, no R wave, P wave, R wave. The differences between these two different types of uh, second degree AV block is here we have a progressive lengthening of the PR interval, so the P wave through the R wave, until we have a missed uh, QRS complex, and then it goes back to a short PR interval, and then it would progressively lengthen, miss, progressively lengthen, miss, like that. Where Mobitz type 2, and I don't care if you know these names for this course, but Mobitz type 2, there's not that progressively lengthening PR interval. There's just simply a missing QRS complex that happens randomly. Um, and then the last one here is just showing um, a 2 1 block, which means normal, missing, normal, missing, normal, and then it'd be another missing. So that's why we call it 2 to 1. Third degree AV block, so again, AV block meaning the signal not getting from the atriums to the ventricles. We have P waves that are being shown here with the green, and they're happening at regular intervals. Some of them are probably being hidden by QRS complexes or T waves. Um, so you have a P wave, you probably have a P wave here. P wave, P wave, probably a P wave that's hidden here. P wave, probably hidden. P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave. And if you look though, the QRS complexes, these brown ones, they're not happening at the same intervals as the P waves. Each one is happening at a regular interval, but they're not coordinated with each other. They have different intervals. And that is, again, the third degree AV block, where there's no electrical signal getting through the AV node, and so the atriums and the ventricles end up just doing their own thing and not being coordinated anymore. The next abnormal finding on ECG on our list, uh, actually we're going to do two together here. So we have ST segment deviation, both elevation shown with these sort of gold yellow highlights and depression shown by the blue highlights. Um, remember, elevation is typically some sort of myocardial infarction or a heart attack. The depression, these blue ones, are typically a sign of ischemia. So in this example, this person's probably having some sort of coronary blockage that is progressed to the point of a heart attack in part of the heart, but only causing somewhat of a lack of blood flow to another part of the heart. So some of the heart is infarcting, meaning it's actually dying, the tissue's dying, while some of the heart is just ischemic, meaning a lack of oxygen. Explaining why these become elevated or depressed from an electrical standpoint is a little bit complicated, but if you're up to the challenge, scan this QR code or go to this link here, and there's a really nice explanation of ST segment changes um, in that website. They also do a nice job of talking about T-wave inversion, which is another sign of ischemia that I'm not talking about here in this video. Um, but go ahead and go to that, and it'll go over that for you and help you understand why these are elevated or depressed. The last condition that was on our table that I wanted to cover in this video 
our bundle branch blocks. And again, we have right and left bundle branch blocks. So and if we look at our heart diagram here, we go through the AV node, through the bundle of his, and then we split into the left and the right bundle branches. Um, and either one of those can be, become blocked, which means the electrical activity no longer goes through it appropriately. Um, and essentially what ends up happening is, so let's say we have a left bundle branch block. So let's say it's right here. What ends up happening is the electrical signal comes down the left bundle branch, gets to where the block is, then it has to travel out into the muscle, back into the left bundle branch to travel back down and around the heart the way it was supposed to. The problem with that is that the muscle cells, as we mentioned at the beginning of this video, don't conduct the electrical current from cell to cell nearly as fast as the pacemaker cells that make up this sort of electrical network. That's the reason why we have the pacemaker cells in this electrical network in the first place. So if it has to go out into the muscle in order to get around a block, it's going to happen really, really slowly. And so what's gonna happen is, in the case of a left bundle branch block, the right uh, ventricle is going to depolarize and contract when it's supposed to. The left one is going to be slightly delayed because it has to go around that blockage. And that's why you end up with this RR pattern here. So looking specifically at V6 or the other V leads near V6, um, a left bundle branch block is going to show an RR prime uh, pattern, something similar to this. Again, we have two different R waves, essentially two different QRS complexes happening because the left and the right ventricles are not aligned anymore. Um, if we look at V1 and we had a right bundle branch block, meaning the block is on this side, the right side, instead of the left side, we would have a similar R, R prime type pattern, um, meaning the left side is going to be uh, moving through the heart the way it should, and the right side is moving slower than it should because, again, there's a block there where it has to go around into the muscle and back down. So that's gonna cause a slower signal, giving us, again, two different R waves in either of these bundle branch block conditions. All right, so that was a very quick overview of ECG. And um, again, this could have been a much, much longer video or a complete series of videos. And that's really what you should um, look for if you're gonna be working with ECGs on a regular basis. You need more than what I just showed you in this video. Um, but I hope that was a, a reasonable starting point for you and something that allows you to understand what is being talked about when you read textbooks like the ACSM guidelines textbook. Um, because it does mention these different uh, ECG abnormalities just sort of in passing and is expecting you to already know what they mean. Um, from this video, again, I wouldn't ex expect you to be able to interpret it, but I hope that you will at least be able to come back and look at your notes. And when you see the, it written in the text, you can kind of understand what it is they're talking about. All right, so again, hope that was helpful. Please come back and watch another video. Thanks.